fine okay, okay? Yeah. no problem can you hear okay. me madam Hello? yes dr sajdev we can hear you very clearly no problems at all and seeing me properly yes okay. uh, yes much better than before <laughs> but your slides are absolutely clear i wouldn't say that of you <laughs> Sorry, but her slides are important, and Dr. Kamala will show your photograph a little longer. Amit, you note that, no? Sure, ma'am. You can take a card. Right. Uh, good afternoon today is the foundation day of nutrition foundation of india we are very very happy that after a few days of dull gray sky the sky is blue the sun is shining and the cold is becoming less in delhi so that we really feel comfortable and happy every year we celebrate the foundation day the morning is a governing body meeting with our governing body members an afternoon spent listening to an eminent scientist delivering the c ramachandran memorial lecture and all our friends faculties and students coming and attending the lecture in nutrition foundation of india covid has brought several changes in every single aspect of life and even our event is to some extent adversely affected that because all our governing body members are joining us virtually only today but every dark cloud has a silver lining for the first time we do have substantial number of people who are outside delhi joining us as participants why only outside delhi we have participants from you from rome from uk from usa four corners of the world able to join in and able to listen to and participate in this excellent event we also want to say right in the beginning thank you for uh, allowing us to um, do one unusual thing in this lecture we talked to dr sachdev and said normally questions and are not entertained after an oration but we do have a high tea after the event where everybody will sit together and discuss it with the speaker in the absence of this would he mind if we have a qa session in the end and he very readily accepted so again one another departure this time is that there is a question and answer session for those of you who are for whatever reasons having some interruptions in the beginning because we have cyclones we have electricity failures we have internet failures all in four corners of india and i do not know what is happening beyond india we are recording that event and in another week the recorded link will be available and any one of you who want it can request us and we will share it with you thank you very much for taking such an interest and participating in such large numbers in this excellent event may i now request uh, mrs malini seshadri to introduce the lecture lecture series 
that's the mail received so the internet is is completely now okay one second so one second many, okay one second um Um, uh, share, please. Amit, would you turn on my share, please? Okay. As uh, Mrs. Malini is trying to to show. Those of you who have been coming here often, the fact that we are, as you can see, functional in and in a blue sky world, had really tried to celebrate this event. As you can see, as you enter, the NFI is decorated with flowers. For Foundation Day. The traditional dia, which our governing body members used to light, and a smiling Dr. Gopalan, blessing us from wherever he is and ensuring that we continue to function in the usual extremely valid fashion. So, we really feel happening despite the COVID epidemic. And we look forward to continuing to play our part so that the world today, especially women and children, are facing because of the pandemic. We will try to do what we can to reduce the burdens and if both these are not within our means, so that they gain some solace. Uh, are we able to uh, get Dr. Malini, uh, Mrs. Malini in this? No, ma'am, I can't see her name in the list of panelists. Okay. And uh, no, Malini Seshadri is not coming on. There is an electricity yeah. failure. Okay. Ma'am, she um, has suggested that you go ahead, ma'am. She passed on the message to go ahead. Okay. Um, please show us the, uh, share the, oh, I'm starting now, no? Yes. Amit, will you now share uh, the content? This lecture was, uh, an endowment was made by Dr. C. Gopalan and Mrs. Sita Gopalan. They, uh, Mr. Ramachandran was an extremely brilliant medical student who at the age of 19 years passed away because of infective hepatitis and complications following it. The parents wanted the brilliant youngster to be remembered forever and forever as a person who adored reading science, as a person who always believed in research, and therefore initiated a series of lectures which will be given on the Foundation Day by an eminent speaker, there is no specific subject on which they should speak. Any subject of their choice, an area where they have worked for decades and have contributed immensely 
to understanding or alle alleviating the problems. We have had this every year for the last, ever since 1995 in this premises. And every year, this is one of the things that all of us look forward to and enjoy listening to. You will now hear Dr. Kamala Krishnaswamy introducing the speaker for the current year. Thank you, Prima. May I request me to put the photograph of Dr. Sachidev? I'm immensely pleased to introduce Dr. Professor Hashpal Singh Sachdev, who is a senior consultant in pediatrics and clinical epidemiology at Sitaram Bhatia Institute of Science and Research in New Delhi. I have known him for several years as an excellent scientist, and he has had several positions to his credit. He is honorary senior research fellow, UCL Institute of Global Health, University College London, UK, adjunct professor, St. John's Research Institute, Bangalore, and a well-known practicing pediatrician. He also served as professor, Department of Pediatrics, Malwan Azad Medical College until 2006, the National President in Association of Pediatrics, Secretary Nutrition Society of India, Editor-in-Chief of Indian Pediatrics, and Visiting Professor, MRC Life Course Epidemiology Unit, South He He's an outstanding scientist, a very passionate researcher, with several stellar papers and prestigious journals. I wish to first congratulate him for being recognized globally today, being in the top 2% of the science, uh, scientists on the basis of citations of his very good, excellent publications. Professor Sashdev's current research interests are developmental origins of adult cardiometabolic disease, nutrition in children and mothers, in low and middle income countries, childhood obesity, and several systematic reviews on nutrition and health. Professor Sachdev, to his credit, has over 300 in publications. Uh, he has edited 16 books and contributed to 39 reports. The systematic reviews include the popular Cochrane reviews on nutrition and child health, and has been an editor of the Cochrane Developmental Psychosocial and Learning Problems Group since 2008. Honors received include fellowships from three prestigious academies, namely the National Academy of Medical Sciences, Indian Academy of Pediatrics, the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, and he is a National Research Award recipient. And uh, Professor Sachdev has provided honorary services in various advisory capacities, including as chairperson to the Government of India, Development uh, Department of Biotechnology, Indian Council of uh, Medical Research, Food Safety and Standards Authority of India, and a number of national and international organizations, including membership in several WHO guideline development programs. Today, he is going to deliver Sri Ramachandran Memorial Lecture on Primordial Prevention of Adult Chronic Diseases in the first thousand days. I now invite uh, Professor Sachdev to give his presentation. I, I would uh, uh, just like to 
show you this virtual memento today, which would actually be given to you by Dr. Prema Ramachandran at a later date. This is our usual routine, and unfortunately, this time we are not able to hand it over in person to you. Professor Sachide. Thank you so much. Uh, can I have the share? Yeah. First of all, thank you so much to the organizers for bestowing me with this great honor. I have heard of Mr. Ramachandra from Sarat and Professor Gopalan, and he has a striking resemblance to Sarat, who did his senior residency under me. I'm sure he must have been a very brilliant person, and it was indeed a loss to science that we lost him so earlier on. Uh, Thank you for the elaborate introduction, madam, which raises the expectation, and I am not sure whether I'll be able to live up to them, but let me try. I have chosen the subject of primordial prevention of adult chronic disease in the first thousand days for this oration, because this is an issue in which I believe a lot, and a lot of my work revolves around it. I have organized the talk in the following sections. First, I will present the background to those of you who do not are not aware of this part. Present some of the limitations of the evidence that I am going to present. The human evidence from the mother and the child perspective, and some important concerns in the basis of the recent developments and the data that has come about. And finally, I will conclude my talk. Now, what is the first thousand days? This terminology was coined by Hillary Clinton some time back based on science. It encompasses the period from the conception till the two years of the age. And one might ask, why is it crucial? First, one is dealing with two lives, the mother and the fetus. It's the period which is more vulnerable to insults and in the past two decades, it has become clear that it could have important consequences for adult health and human capital. This is the hypothesis of the developmental regions of adult diseases, which is credited to Professor David Barker, with whom I had the fortune to work with about two decades back, and he really generated my interest in this field. If the fetal programming hypothesis states that a stimulus or insult at a sensitive or critical period of development has a lasting or a lifelong significance on the structure, physiology, and metabolism of the organism. One of the most dramatic illustration of this hypothesis comes from the animal experiments. Don't bother about the complicated drawing on the right lower side of it. But there is a yellow mouse, which you can see on the left-hand side, this one, which carries the agouti gene, which gives it the yellow coat and also the obesity and diabetes. The brown mice is genetically identical. Its mother was supplemented with methyl nutrients, for example, folic acid during pregnancy, which increased the DNA methylation, permanently silencing the fetal agouti gene and leading to the brown color, which had no obesity and diabetes. So that was a very dramatic illustration, which one would have liked to see. But two points I wish to make out here, that mice are mice and humans are humans. And in this, dosages that were used to silence the gene were about 1,000 times, which one would see in the variations in the human beings or being used routinely. So where does the human evidence for this hypothesis come? I would be primarily focusing on the low and the middle income country scenario because that's what is relevant to us after Professor Barker had shown this in Hartfordshire. We revived 
the new delhi birth cohort which was set up by my mentor professor santosh bhargav and dr shanti ghosh in 1969 the cohort is since then about 50 years plus old and as you can see in the photograph there are four generations and we have expanded to a collaboration which is global now of five cohorts from low and middle income countries the one from guatemala is almost of the same age delhi of course cebu philippines sweto in south africa and pelotas in brazil so the first seminal paper that we brought out from this was in the new england journal of diabetes in which after tracing these children we had done glucose test and subjects who had impaired glucose tolerance or diabetes their growth or their antecedents whatever data we had in the first 1000 days was compared with those who did not have so here in if you see this green line this is the average of the body mass index or the ponderosity of the cohort the children who developed impaired glucose tolerance or diabetes later on at the young age of 32 years they initially were born a little thinner and strikingly they went on becoming thinner till about 3 or 4 years of age and after that started a slow ascent which went on and here just with a change of 0.5 standard deviation from here to here they developed diabetes now important for this narrative or what was believed at and is still believed at this time that these adult chronic diseases are diseases of the overnourished or the obese one what we saw was that till 12 years those who develop diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance less than 1% only one child had obesity while 30 to 50% that means nearly one third to half of them were non obese so which proves that the current anthropometry wise if you start getting heavier to yourself you can develop diabetes and impaired glucose tolerance this has been confirmed in several studies including in the cohorts so this is the observational evidence that we look at and recently we have analyzed the data in uh, which shows on the human capital aspects that higher linear growth in the first 2 years is associated in adulthood with better outcomes of formal school education occupation and wealth there is a small but a definite effect which doesn't go away after adjusting for several confounders many of which have equal contribution to play and in 2 to 5 years there is less and inconsistent effect so this explains why there is a lot of talk about the first 1000 days and why we want to intervene in that and the natural question that arises is that can we operate in the first 1000 days to prevent adult chronic disease later on now the evidence that i am going to show you later has several limitations we might, which we must be aware of before we sort of go back with the opinion that yes this can be done or can't be done now obviously from the first 1000 days to adulthood when these diseases strike there is a very long exposure and you can't wait for a lifetime and in which things may change and the relationships may change or the association may change so one has to rely on surrogate outcomes and also one has to rely mostly on observational data because some of the randomized control trials could be considered unethical for example giving breastfeeding or not breastfeeding seeing whether adolescent pregnancy or late pregnancy makes a difference or not it would be unethical to decide which time of pregnancy and in most of these studies the focus has been on the anthropometric parameter of obesity which i showed to you in my earlier slide may not hold true in our setting rather than the pure metabolic disease and many of these studies are reported from high income countries and its extrapolation to low and middle income countries like ours may be questionable and at many times one sees an intermingling of faith and evidence so let us come to see the human evidence from the perspective of the mother one of the important and the earlier 
analysis was done was from the cohorts, collaboration of the five cohorts, which I outlined to you. And a very interesting part came that there was a U-shaped relationship for the plasma glucose levels in adulthood or in systolic blood pressure, depending upon when the child was born or the mother's age. This was statistically significant for a quadratic trend, as you can see here, P.005 with some heterogeneity 0 0.02 for the young mothers and the older mothers at both spectrums having higher blood glucose, which could translate into impaired glucose tolerance or diabetes. And this persisted in several models. We used five models depending upon what confounders were adjusted for. Although a similar trend was seen for systolic blood pressure, it was not statistically significant. Similarly, here from Mysore, we have the Parthenon study led by Krishnaveni, in which the parental diabetes and the adiposity in the girls was seen. And you can see that all ages till 14 years, the children who were born to the obese diabetes mothers had greater adiposity or fat content as compared to the green control ones. So it's obvious that several maternal conditions could influence the propensity to develop adult chronic disease if one believes in this intermediate surrogates or the later ones in the adult as we have shown. And amongst these are obesity, diabetes, pregnancy-induced hypertension, diabetes begets diabetes, obesity begets obesity, and pregnancy-induced hypertension gets, begets hypertension later on in the life. But what's not very clear from the evidence is whether treatment of these maternal conditions does have an offspring effect of reducing this or then getting it later on. So what has been the practice rightly so is to prevent and screen this in the offsprings as well as try to treat the condition in the mother. There are some other things, important things, which in observational evidence one sees the evidence of this. And this here is what I am showing a forest plot for some of the students who may be there and may not know what this is a forest plot implies. We are showing all the studies here, which were have could have been collated on these in that systematic reviews and the odds ratio as the effect size so the dots here for each study are the mean effect size and the two arms are the ones of the 95 percent confidence intervals and the vertical line is the null effect so if in a particular study the arm crosses the vertical line that means the effect is not statistically significant while in this study the first one as you see the effect doesn't cross, it is statistically significant here. And this here is the overall effect size that one looks at. And here you could see that it is statistical. So if the mother sp um, smoked and they saw the obesity in the child up till 18 years of the age, there was a greater chance of overweight, more so for the obesity, which was about one and a half or 1.6 times. Now, in our Indian context, we do know that tobacco chewing is a very important thing, which could be analogous to smoking. We have very little data on that, but that's a possibility one could see. And some data is emerging that indoor air pollution, nitrous oxide and particulate, which we are experiencing currently, there is a publication on that shows, is also associated with obesity in the children. This is an interesting interesting study which was conducted by Caroline Fall and Dr. Potdar and his team from the Sneha group. It was a randomized controlled trial of micronutrient rich supplementation preconceptually. That means in women who are planning to get pregnant and during pregnancy in about 6,000 women. There were two arms. In one arm, you were just giving the green leafy powder, I mean fruit powder, the samosas or energy in the calorie with the, which also had a milk powder. In the other one, this was supplemented with micronutrients, but they were food-based micronutrients which are dried by a process and put into those snacks to be given. This was known as the Project SARS has been published and 
Of the 6,513 women who were randomized, 1826 became pregnant and were supplemented more than three months before the conception. As the literature would show, the birth size effect was there about 50 grams overall in them. But paradoxically, what was seen was uh, if one said that anthropometry is a good surrogate for undernutrition, then one would have expected a greater effect in the undernourished women or the one who were thin. But the effect size was much more in the women who were obese than the women who were thin. The low birth weight prevalence reduced with this. But from our perspective, the more important aspect was what happened to gestational diabetes in the women who were supplemented versus those who were not supplemented. Now, there is still not uh, a little confusion about what the definition of maternal gestational diabetes should be taken. The current consensus perhaps is to go for the WHO definition in 2013 now, in this intention to treat analysis, this is the cutoff for the definition by the WHO 1999 criteria, in which they had seen that there was a difference or about half uh, uh, the effect size of reduction in gestational diabetes mellitus. But however, when you use the WHO 2013 criteria, which is this dotted line as the cutoff, this difference was not statistical significance. So one is not really very sure about what's going to happen in our scenario about this. Now, we did a systematic review on antenatal micronutrient supplements in which there was no evidence of offspring effects two and a half to about eight and a half years later, there were one to four studies all South Asia on either the blood body composition, blood pressure, blood glucose, elevated glycosated hemoglobin, serum cholesterol or microalbuminemia and renal volume. So there was no evidence of any beneficial effect for the surrogates of adult cardiometabolic diseases. One important interesting aspect which is very well studied in the Western one is the pregnancy lifestyle intervention and gestational diabetes, the RCT evidence. Only one of the 29 RCTs in this systematic review, the upper one shows the effect of the diet change. This middle one is the effect of the physical activity change. And the last one is both a combination of physical activity and diet change. They found that there was a small positive effect, which was better if it was starting less than 15 weeks of the gestation, it was better. The effect across the BMI spectrum, that's mean thin and the heavier woman was similar. There was evidence of lesser maternal weight gain and possibility of improvement of pregnancy induced hypertension in two trials. Similarly, then maternal exercise, which is now coming a little to the fore here in the, especially in the upper socioeconomic strata, but the poorer strata, unless the women are forced to work, they are asked to rest here in India. This systematic review showed that there was no higher fetal loss or prematurity. There was less large for gestational age babies uh, about 30 percent no effect on small for gestational age babies less cesarean section with the odds ratio of 0.8 that means 20 percent less cesarean deliveries and in one trial there was a lower five-year insulin resistance the weighted mean difference of the birth weight was minus 31 grams that means the children was 31 grams lower. Now, caesarean and offspring overweight or obesity, caesarean sections have really become an epidemic and ours is perhaps one of the institution which is actively trying to lower it and is at par with what should be the rates. But in some places you do get nearly 80% caesarean section rates. And Caesarean section rates, this systematic review shows that the odds ratio of delivering an overweight or obese child become 
This here is a huge trial on 22,068 offsprings not uh, entered in this systematic reviews. And 15 to 71 women were at 20 to 28 years of age. Even in them, the odds ratio of becoming obese was 1.5 of the children becoming overweight or obese was 1.15. That means 15% higher. And however, what was interesting in this review was that if the woman with the first cesarean had a subsequent vaginal delivery, they were at a 31% lower risk of delivering an overweight or obese child. The postulates, the biological postulates for this are changes in the microbiome, the initiation of breastfeeding, and whether the cesarean section could actually be a proxy for some underlying disease, for example, PIH or vascular resistance, and that could be leading to this development of obesity. Coming to the evidence in children, we are all familiar with and are propagating, especially in our country, the breastfeeding. The evidence for this came from an observational review of the systematic review of WHO, wherein breastfeeding was shown at later life to be the children who were breastfed exclusively or predominantly had lower total blood cholesterol, blood pressure, lower risk of diabetes, lower risk of overweight or obesity, and they performed better on intelligent quotient. So there is quite a lot of, at least most of us believe that this is true. We conducted with Dr. Geeta Trilokramar here at the Institute of Health Economics a vitamin D supplementation trial from zero to six months at that time. And even now, vitamin D is supposed to be an important player in the body composition or the metabolic effects. But unfortunately, or fortunately, we could not discern any evidence of effect on the fat-free mass, fat mass, or the fat percentage and the systolic blood pressure or the diastolic blood pressure. Now, I wonder how many of you know this, at least initially it was news to me that the, there's an early taste which the infants are born with or an innate taste which tracks throughout the life. And this becomes important in the time period of complementary feeding. The infants, we all have maybe endorphin secretions and we light up, we have a preference for foods which have sugar, salt, and are high energy foods containing a lot of fats. There's a dislike or less preference for sour and bitter foods, like some vegetables, and you need to offer it repeatedly. While in preschool children, they reject new foods, which is known as neophobia. So complementary feeding time, or maybe the earlier time becomes a good way to try to see if one could intervene and this could have an effect in later life. Uh, this is courtesy of Sanjay Kindra from uh, London School of Tropical Medicine Hygiene Review. And these are the three trials in which uh, at <coughs> eight years, up to eight years or six months to eight years, they <coughs> uh, the infants were seen who were offered a normal diet with or without added salt or one with a reduced salt and the results not unsurprisingly showed that there was a lower systolic blood pressure in those who had less intake of salt although the effect size was small but it was definitely there now there were three primordial prevention trials with adolescent blood pressure outcomes which are listed here from developed countries like Finland, Netherlands, and Belarus, uh, if you want to call it that, the probate trial. And they extended from infancy through adolescence. The strip trial is really the key trial. And apart from, they had different intervention focus. There was counseling on healthful fats, plus more fruits, vegetable, whole grains, and less sodium in the strip trial, which did not end at the complementary period, but continued till the children reached adolescent and even later, which I will just talk about a little, the randomization was individual in the first two and clustered in the last one. So the first two trials showed a decrease in systolic blood pressure of minus 0.1, 
which was statistically significant. The second one was minus 0.36, while the probate trial, the cluster randomized trial of breastfeeding promotion showed a null effect. Now the strip trial, people continued till, as I said, the early adolescent, but what was important and interesting to be seen was that 15 to 20 years, the metabolic syndrome, as we recall it, was 10 to 13 percent in the control group and 6 to 7 percent in the intervention group, which was roughly half, and that is an important finding to my mind. Now, observational data of 280 studies shows that there are other risk factors for childhood obesity, like excessive gestational weight gain, high birth weight, accelerated infant weight gain, low maternal infant relationship, and infant antibiotic exposure. Uh, the last two leaving aside, no one really knows as far as I'm aware how to reduce the gestational weight gain without causing a harm or one is born with a high birth weight, so has to continue like this. Now, obesity prevention, here again I am highlighting, these are based on obesity and anthropometric criteria. Most of them are from high and middle income countries. They are showing so many trials, they're showing a little sort of a mixed effect with one most of the trials coming to which have offered a mixture of this thing that there is a little effect on the body mass index. So one, if one just leave the details which are there, there are many other which are isolated micronutrients, fish oil, hydrolyzed proteins and several things which have been tried, no effect with them, mostly null. But a high protein and nutrient rich and rich formula has resulted in higher obesity or fat mass at five to eight years of age. The really important ones are the ones which have shown that a combination of diet, physical activity, and sleep counseling. In five of these trials, there was a benefit. So the message emerging from this was that one should try to focus on the individual as well as the family behavior, both in the clinic, home, or community. But it's noteworthy that the effect size was small and it was seen between one and 10 years. So the message from this is that community and family centered interventions are important. This is just sort of a hot from the shelf systematic review by uh, one of our cohorts collaborators, R.A. Stein, on 33,551 participants in 21 countries but it has been done a little differently. They have combined all the antenatal ones, the mother and the child, and only the child interventions together. So that sort of mixes up things a little bit. And the intervention started from conception and in some till seven years of age, one study, which I had referred to earlier, the STRIP trial from infancy till 20 years of age, the follow-up was between seven and 73 years of age. Seven intervention types were looked at. You need not bother about this, I will summarize this. And four cardio categories of cardiometabolic outcomes were seen, which were either biomarkers, cardiovascular, body size, and composition and subclinical or clinical disease. Now, again, not surprisingly, most findings were null. Uh, what was important was that the fasting glucose was lower in 15 studies in which infant young child feeding interventions primarily related to breastfeeding and salt and sugar reduction were there. There's no data. Uh, then the body mass index was higher paradoxically in the studies in which, as I had told you earlier, some high energy supplements or protein energy dense feeds were offered. What the one trial, the STRIP trial, which I had mentioned, the ongoing and personalized dietary counsel lowered the glucose, cholesterol, improved the blood endothelial function, and reduced the risk of metabolic syndrome. This is really one of the key trials from Finland, which was there. Some futuristic prospects have been uh, stated by many researchers, which could include designer diets, depending upon the what the child was born in or what the child's genotype is, 
possibility of using newborn and infant genes to build up the muscle or make the muscle take a little more insulin, uh, help insulin along, some sleep kits. And finally, the poop kits pills have been tried in an effort to influence the microbiome, but these are all in an experimental stage and one really do, doesn't know what is going to uh, happen. Is it a hope or a hype? Now I come to a key part of uh, the presentation in which uh, I and Professor Kurpad have been discussing this for a long, long time, and we have some legitimate concerns about the recent developments or how the, our national programs are running. And uh, Professor Kurpad has been kind enough to donate me this uh, slide, and he recently held a seminar on the nutrient requirements. And we were all made to believe till a few years ago that several of us or the population has so much deficiency, which was based on the recommended dietary allowance, which is intended to cover 97.5% of the population's needs, while the population should be looking at the estimated average requirements, which is at the main, this side of it. Now, we do need a single population nutrient requirement value as a guesstimate to allow the policymakers to initiate the programs. And as I have said, the EIR is more important because if we go to the RDA, give everyone this, then this curve is going to be shift to the right and it might exceed the tolerable upper limits or there is a risk of overnourishing the populations. So how does this theory come into what I'm saying? We recently calculated with the aid of data helpfully shared from the NIN or the NNMB. Uh, Mr. Kurpat did that along with the several other peoples. And to our surprise, if you all know, the ICDS or the portion take home ref, ration is supposed to be 500 calories, but the deficit really is 250 calories. And the moment you go above this, if you believe that there's no sharing or wastage or corruption, it doesn't go, then we are giving them twice the amount of food which is to be given. I leave, if the child consumes the, all the 500 calories, I leave it to your imagination what could happen. There's no evidence on this uh, created at least. What could happen metabolically to these children? Similarly, there's a great hype at the national levels about what is known as severe acute malnutrition, which to my mind is just a severe thinness. Our phenotype is a little thinner, about one standard deviation thinner. And one should be, has been made to believe that it will save millions of lives, but we have presented two data, one with Professor Kurpa, uh, one with Professor Kapil, and another one with the University College of London, wherein we, we have shown that the mortality, which was believed to be very high in these children, if they are not uh, given any food, is not as high as it was believed. It is the case fatality was just ranging between one to 2%. Now, don't mistake me, I'm not arguing that they don't need extra food or there may be uh, other conditions which need to be done. But the point I'm trying to make is that the uh, randomized control trials on thousand odd subjects or the other, the maximum the Indian child with a severe acute malnutrition can achieve is a gain of five grams per kg per weight gain per day. But paradoxically, uh, what's important is we are recommending 175 to 200 kilocalories per kg per day in such children, while if the calculations are done, it is only in our setting at 5K, it comes to about 100 kilocalories per kg per day. And the WHO guidelines also recommends 100 to 135 kilocalories per kg per day. And remember, these are thin children who have little of the pancreatic function and the other organ functions, thin muscle, and giving extra calories to them is certainly, to my mind, going to lead to a metabolic imbalance. The most scaring part comes from the recent comprehensive national nutrition survey in which five to 19 years old subjects, this is data as yet not published. And uh, we have looked at this. Now, 
nearly 19,000 data which has had an excellent quality control, including from CDC and the labs doing it there. We find that the risks are likely to be ignored because the threats are invisible. This is really scary data, at least to me and other colleagues who talk about this thing. So if we define metabolic obesity by the cutoffs like cholesterol above 200 milligrams or hyperlipidemia, hypertriglyceridemia, or impaired fasting glucose more than 100, then either dyslipidemia or dysglycemia, which has been referred in the literature as metabolic obesity, occurs in this red portion in the entire 19,056% of the children had this. And clustering of the two borderline abnormalities occurred in nearly one third of the children. I repeat, one third of the children and these in the Western scenario are supposed to lead to active interventions, dietary and physical activity to reduce this. But what was really most scary was one would tend to believe that the normal weight or the thin subjects would have almost zero metabolic obesity. And this on the right side is the graph which shows the metabolic obesity and thinness. And this here, the left side, the graph, which is below minus two SD, the traditional one used to classify thin or wasted children, which are considered for supplementation of food or energy dense supplementation, albeit not in this age group. In them, 3,552 children, 54% had evidence of metabolic dys, uh, dyslipidemia or dysglycemia. Minus 2 to minus 1 SD was 54.7%. Yes, the prevalence was slightly higher in those who were 1 SD or 2 SD or more. But the point which emerges from this is that 10 children, more than half of them have evidence of metabolic obesity and the normal weight. And if you're just focusing on the overweight and obese to prevent this adult chronic diseases, only 10% of the total burden of metabolic obesity will come to the fore because primarily most of our children have their BMI within the range up to plus one SD. So why am I telling this? This is not in tune with the adult disease. I think it is in the tune with the, if you see the earlier concerns I expressed about the chances of overfeeding to them. And we have found that you would think that this would be confined to the richer ones, but no, the poorer are equally at risk as well as the rural people. And paradoxically, it's more in the poorer people, the triglyceride elevation and the impaired glucose tolerance. So one needs to very carefully think about what overfeeding is there. So could this expand to under five years or above 19 years when the women are trying to become pregnant? I began hunting for this data. Professor Yagnik talks a lot about this. I requested him, Dr. Caroline Fall, they and Shinjini Bhatnagar, who has started a very new cohort from uh, Gurgaon, and Dr. Sadhna Joshi, who's ringing a PET cohort, and all of them very kindly shared this unpublished data with me. And here you can see that the prevalence of gestational diabetes in women, women who had a body mass index before pregnancy of less than 18.5, the conventional cutoff to define thinness, was quite a lot from 8 to 14%. Dr. Sadhna Joshi's study had used a different indicator which underestimates the prevalence, but it still makes a point that it was there. And the difference between the those who were thin and the other ones who was there, but it was not as huge as one would expect. One would never have expected the thin woman to have this prevalence, which is seen here. And this is solid data in the past. 10 years, less than 10, no, it's in the past 10 years, the Mumbai slums, and it is from the poorer regions, the Pune, and this is from the middle socioeconomic in Delhi. Now, why is it important? It's important because the World Health Organization and even our country believes in balanced protein energy supplementation in undernourished populations, pushing them with extra food. So to my mind, it is likely to inflate this or create more of the problems in those who are already predisposed, but I don't have hard data to suggest this. So to my mind, the public health programs 
need to strengthen their evidence base to optimize the need for and constituents of uh, pregnancy food supplementation. Who needs it? Should we have a biomarker before we decide to supplement that woman? The portion feeding, do we need to reduce the amount? There is an element of perception in this. It's very difficult to talk to the stakeholder. They say it's perception, it's perception. No, no they are thin, they are malnourished. You can't over talk about that. And using RUTF for severely thin, ready to use a very high energy. The caloric requirements are being much more overestimated, but now this is believed or there's a lot of push to give it to not severely wasted, but the children who are between minus two to minus three STs. So we should have this evidence base before we are probably, sometimes it is said the path to health can be paved with good intentions. We need to ensure that we are not causing harm. Finally, I would like to conclude and say that there's very limited evidence for prevention of adult disease in the first thousand days. One size doesn't fit all. You have to do the tailoring, which child requires what and how, especially if you have the biomarkers. The effect size is small. There are no magic bullets. And family behavior emerges to be an important, at least from the Western uh, data. So one should focus on lifestyles. And more important is that it is a continual effort. It's not that you just do it in those thousand days and forget and later on you get the same thing going. That's not how life works. You have to have a continual effort with that. Fortunately, several of these interventions conquer with the guidelines like the optimal age for childbearing, breastfeeding and so on. But we do need an urgent research on the ongoing programs. I, sincerely believe that this is a moral and an ethical obligation that we do not cause harm. I have been saying this for the past 15, 20 years, along with several of my colleagues, some of them hopefully are there in this thing. But people laugh at us or say the give us the evidence. And I try to console myself. Sometimes I see to the court. One day, I hope daylight emerges. And with this, I'd like to acknowledge my mentor, Professor Bhargav, and the NDC team, Caroline Fowl and Clive Osmond from the MRC, Anura Kupa, with whom we have had a lot of discussions, Dr. Yamik and Sadhana Joshi from Sneha, the cohorts, and Shinji Bertlager and the various funding agencies which have led to this fruitful research. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and I am ready to face the firing line if I may say so. Thank you very much, Dr. Sachide, for that very lucid presentation of a very complicated subject. And they're bringing out the fact, perhaps, that we are doing, we may be causing harm with food feeding, and we need to rethink on the calories which are being pushed into the government programs. Thank you very much. We feel that we do not have the last answer for it as yet. So I would like you to perhaps elaborate it, question and answer. Uh, and I now uh the lecture for uh, question and answer so already i have a question do i start answering them yeah please so uh dr ahmed Raza asked thank you for the informative lecture can the food based dietary guidelines also be a tool to curb the rise of non-communicable diseases this is an excellent question and really is something that we have been trying to push for, we should be looking at foods rather than the products. And I did hint at this, the food-based dietary guidelines that we should be looking at less sugar, less salt, and maybe fat, I'm not too sure. It will depend on the situation. And above that, the fruits, vegetables, 
intake needs to be put into this. Of course, there is a little evidence on the adults, but exactly starting in these thousand days, if it influences later on, logic would say if it works with the prolonged exposure, it would be. And ye yes, this should be one of the most important things which should be studied and done rather than looking at products to make children a millimeter or two millimeter taller or a little broader. Thank you. Thank you for giving this question. Any other questions, please? I can't see. Yeah, this is the only question we have received so far, sir. I have asked the participant to post their questions. The uh, link for the Q&A is in the chat box. And they can click the link and post their questions. Uh, Amit, can some of us who are uh, able to unmute also ask the question verbally? Yes, yes, ma'am. You are most welcome, ma'am. Okay, thank you. you. Have the discussion, uh, as I said, I enjoyed it immensely. And what was really the most striking thing is look too much and too little are both terrible. That is one message that comes through very clearly. I would also like to request you to elaborate a little bit on the fact, have we been um, trying to push things a little, you know, the speed at which change occurs. I'll give you two examples where this is uh, currently an important thing. As you know, in the past in ICDS, we gave 300 calories to children. That was the norm. Then they said, no, 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 this is too little. It cannot be done. You should really give an early morning breakfast. You should give a lunch. And put together, we should give 500 calories. And some of us protested saying, look, for a preschool child, you can't simply give this much. It's almost half of what the child can eat, even if you are taking only the three to six-year-old children. And you have pointed out beautifully how uh, RUTF and things are really are we trying to hasten the game and therefore pushing them into things which are harmful in the long run? I know it's a not very um, diplomatic question, but I think we need to answer this. No, I, I think you have understood it correctly. And um, diplomacy is one of my weakest fort. And I would go ahead and straight away say that, yes, we have been doing that. It is our obsession with the body size which is causing this thing how it correlates when a lot of confounders come to the play and as a population we are thinner shorter overcoming an intergenerational constraint which is going to cause harm so if we overdo the things we overshoot as you say it is a mismatch between what the body has been built for and what is being offered to it it is likely to cause harm so one should really be very careful about it because to my mind in a child i mean unless you do the biological or a uh, sampling of the child to decide from a biomarker is the child getting overnourished it's anybody's guess and as i showed you with the cnns data with more than 50 percent of the thin ones having evidence of metabolic biomarkers of obesity, you really can't guess it. And how can you say that the child who has become about 0.2 SD or 0.3 SD, a little more broader, has not become overnourished rather than coming to the normal one? So it's a moral and an ethical obligation, and we need to look into this very carefully. Maybe it's time for biomarkers to come in rather than just by seeing a child, a thin child, there are so many thin normal living children uh, running around that that child is undernourished and the only solution is giving food. I would say that. Thank you, I deeply can appreciate the answer. Can I ask one question, please? I want to know in the total calories, which of the macronutrients is more important uh, in terms of uh, uh, metabolic abnormalities or cardiometabolic abnormalities, or is it? No sorry, madam, I, uh, sorry, madam, I lost uh, you in between. Could you repeat the question? I just wanted to know, when you say a certain amount of calories is harmful, 
which of the three macronutrients is responsible for this? Is there any idea or there is you know, only the proteins which are harmful? We should reduce proteins. And what happens to the carbohydrates in that case? It's a very uh, difficult thing to play these three macronutrients together. Yeah, excellent question, madam. And I think uh, we need hard evidence for this from the consumption surveys or what is happening, but from the NNMB data and the NSSO data, which has been triangulated by uh, Professor Kurpad, and we have done that. The, it has been just, we, it will be submitted as a paper today, the metabolic abnormalities in five to 19. If I go along with those and tell you, it is really probably the energy density primarily from the carbohydrates and excessive sugar, which is likely to be the culprit, which is more being taken in the uh, settings of the rural or the poor one as an energy one. And paradoxically, and perhaps not difficult to understand, the fat intake is lower in these settings. So unless we have some data to guide us about this, we really cannot, uh, it's just uh, again making a guess like a body size is equal to undernutrition. So you have different micronutrients. We do need uh, evidence to answer for that. And okay. there was a related question which has disappeared here from now, which was asked that, uh, how can you have a food box for this thing? Well, uh, Professor Kurpat's team is working on a linear programming at the, uh, with the revised uh, RDA, uh, uh, sorry, the nutrient requirement values in the children and uh, thinking about in the portion. And with this linear programming, you can actually predict how much amount of food as a food basket which needs to come into this. And really the amount of fruits and vegetables required are pretty less, about 50 grams or uh, so, which can meet all the requirements. And the problem with the ICDS foods, which uh, Dr. Prema Ramachandran asks is, it's, we, it's the focus on the quantity rather than the quality which needs to come into this thing. So low energy dense foods like this ultra processed foods are the ones which should be avoided. It should be a balanced, healthy mix with maybe a little more of animal protein or a milk protein coming into this, which might sort out this. This is what the gut feeling says, but obviously you need to test it out in our setting. Then uh, that's, that was how to study the food box I answered. Then uh, can diet serve as a tool to curb oncology recurrence after surgery? Sorry, I think this is beyond this and I'm not familiar with this literature, would not like to comment. Oh. Thank you so much, Caroline, for this question. And I'm glad that you attended this uh, talk. You can't, we can't interact. And uh, yes, your question is very relative. We, uh, very relevant. Should pediatricians measure glucose or lipids routinely? Is increased physical activity a feasible intervention to consider? Let me answer the second one first. I think the uh, as a population, the Indian population is really sedentary. The children are shown to have less physical activity. And in the paper that I'm talking about, one thing that we recommend should be studied is increasing the physical activity, especially including the resistance exercise, which could improve the muscle mass and restore some of the balance. And I would pitch for biochemistry or biomarkers if it is uh, becomes costly and no, why only for the pediatricians and this it should go to the people out there at the primary or the other centers because of the amount or the magnitude of the prevalence that I am seeing above 50 percent and you could try to tailor it around for well, if there's a family history of diabetes or if he's born to obese mother or the other things that this is likely to be much more. But my sense says with the amount of prevalence and the little difference between the ones who are obese or the other ones that it should really be at times because of the real scary data that we have, it should be done for most of the children. We need to test it out and if there are cheap feasible options. Of course, this is subject to debate and generation of evidence, but that's what my gut feeling says. So, 
can diet serve as a tool to help evade the harmful allopathy treatment effects and improve the overall quality of life, especially for the elderly population? I think this is a little away from my talk, uh, and there is some evidence that it could be useful, but it's not the subject part of it. How the elderly diabetic population evades metformin dependency using dietary guidelines? Of course, there are enough studies uh, now, data showing in adults that if you adopt healthy diet as well as a combination with the physical activity, your drug requirement goes down and it prevents the uh, conversion of the impaired fasting glucose to diabetes. Can diet serve as a tool to help the general population come out of dependency of antihypertensive drugs? I think I mentioned that uh, along with diabetes, blood pressure also uh, effect is also seen in that. Uh, Carolyn, I have already answered. In India today, body size varies between states. So can we say that all Indians have smaller body size due within state specific requirements? Uh, yes, the body size does vary between the states, not only between the states, the socioeconomic status, the urban and the rural one. And data from the CNNS, uh, which is uh, being reviewed and uh, uh, being resubmitted, shows that as a population, we are about minus one standard deviation below what the WHO references state. So specific requirements to my mind are not going to depend upon the uh, thinness of this. Uh, they should be, but at currently it is not done. They should be standardized for the body weight. And yes, one should adapt the requirement. There are basic principles. So the requirements for a US population or a British population are not going to be the same as the Indian one. So you go to work out. That's why we had the ICMR and come up with the recent RDA because they tried to standardize it to the Indian context, bioavailability, several issues come into this. Uh, but still we have some distance to go. Those are not standardized for per kg weight except for the micronutrients. But we need to move into that direction and develop a global consensus on that. Pre -preg uh, pregnant obesity is a big problem in urban slums too. It would add to the problem. Yes, that's what I said. But again, one of my main messages, just focusing on obesity is not the solution. Even the thin pregnant women have developed this problem. Well, you do focus on the obese ones, fine, they have a high risk, but you're likely to miss 70%, 80%. And if I look at my child letter, 90% of those who would have these metabolic problems if you don't focus on them. So there's no easy answer to that. There could be uh, advice about exercise or becoming more physically active, but just pushing in food or energy dense foods like that is not a good thing. Uh, one can go about and give fresh fruits and vegetables, but ultimately in pregnancy, at least one should be doing the glucose tolerance and hemoglobin and measuring the blood pressure, which would alert us to tailor the diet and the other interventions. <laughs> the last, uh, uh, how to study the food box, I have answered already. India is so huge and diverse. So can one set of requirements be used for all? Well, my philosophy has been always one size does not fit all. And that's it. You need to tailor it. For our convenience, we do make one size and always think on the left side of the distribution or about the benefit we are causing. Ignore the right side or the possibility of harm, which has become a real big threat right now. Just a suggestion. NAMS publishes its journal a and AMS with theme, and if I should also start a journal with theme and spread this immense info to a larger audience. This is outside my ambit, Professor Prema Ramachandran could do that. Continuing the difference in, in body size will not require, I think I've already answered that.
Sir, sir, we will stop the Q and A now, uh, and uh, we can proceed with the next. Dr. Sarath Gopalan will now propose the vote of thanks. Uh, I thank uh, Professor Sachdev for the wonderful lecture we have had today in this oration, the C. Ramachandra Memorial Lecture and Oration, where he has put the association between the crucial approach to nutritional intervention in the first thousand days and linked it with sound scientific evidence to the development of chronic de degenerative diseases in adult life. He has quoted a number of references, not only from within India, but also references which are in other parts of the world. And uh, in fact, he has reminded us that this association is very uh, important to understand the crucial issues which may be very relevant to all of us, not only in India, but also at a global level from the standpoint of nutritional needs and approach to nutritional needs. At a personal level, I am honored, sir, that you were there today to deliver this oration. I also thank our host for today's uh, webinar who also helped us uh, to uh, coordinate the web activity very well. This is Mr. Amit Chauhan and his team, Mr. Uh, Datta Gupta, and uh, uh, all, all those from team who are present, who have helped us uh, to uh, conduct this activity today. I thank the members of the Governing Nutrition Foundation of India, who have put together their coordinated efforts to contribute to the, the uh, success of today's webinar. Uh, this webinar would not be complete and meaningful without the other important component, apart from the speaker, are the participants. And both our national as well as international participants who have, co have participated and logged in to listen to this lecture. We thank all of them because your participation was crucial and uh, the interaction through the question and answers was crucial to the, uh, to the success of this webinar. So with these words, the C. Ramachandran Memorial Lecture uh, and, uh, and webinar for 2020. It's over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much, Sarath. Uh, may I also thank the speaker, the participants, and the people who asked the questions, who made this a very well. We hope even after the COVID pandemic passes, we'll continue to have perhaps hybrid seminars of this type, so that not only will we cater to Delhi and um, surrounding areas, but continue to draw like-minded people who are doing research in the same kind of things across India and across the world. I'm indeed very, very happy to see at least this kind of extra Delhi participation in every one of the events as a beneficial effect of COVID, which we will continue to reap benefit after COVID passes. Thank you, Ananda. Amit, I think we can close the meeting now. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Have a good evening, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Pri. And thank you, Dr. Sajde, for such a uh, wonderful uh, talk. Event and we at Thema Publishers are really uh, privileged to be your partners for hosting such an event. It's a great pleasure. I wish you all a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.